So hello, um, welcome back to um, Essence of Medicine podcast, the clinical case review. And uh, today we are going to talk about something that maybe by itself is not very common, but it was one of the pivotal moments in the history of medicine that we understood how our body works. And uh, I'm actually online and Neil has joined us, but I'm not able to hear you, Neil. I'm, I'm just going to put the films on and I'm hoping you or somebody else can help if somebody has question that we let the question to be known for everybody and uh, uh, discuss it. It's, and I'm going to try to limit our, this uh, session to half an hour, bear with me. Um, so uh, I, I noticed that I have at, to admit people to for them to join us. So um, Neil, not sure if you are able to hear me. Hello, I think I can hear you now. Oh, excellent, excellent, Neil. So okay. do you mind to just pay attention if somebody asks a question on the YouTube channel that you make sure that I don't miss it? Yes. Excellent. So let's start with this. And you know, everybody is welcome to ask questions, but let's start with this very unspecific presentation of this patient who was referred to me um, many, many years ago with um, a presentation that wasn't specific. Uh, literally, this patient just wasn't feeling well. Um, and more or less went to the ER after, um, after you know, months of unspecific, very unspecific symptoms. Now, Neil, when you look at this patient, um, what is what jumps at you? What, what do you notice in his, in just in his face? I'm noticing the facial asymmetry. It's very slight. Mm -hmm. I can see it on the border of his left, on the left side of his lip. What would you say? What, uh, what would be, if you would see somebody like that, what would you think what his profession is? Oh, he, to me, he looks like a wrestler. Yes, he does, doesn't mm -hmm. he? Why does he look like a wrestler? I think because he seems more bulky or more bulky, bulky. Yeah. very good, very good. He has really massive appearance, right? Right, his features are strong, massive jaw. I'm throwing something out there to you mm. massive jaw, nose. Look at his nose as if he was a boxer that he got punched a few times in the nose mm. and the nose become bigger and flatter yeah i mean he kind of looks like might be jumping the gun maybe acromegaly or <laughs> <laughs> look at his hands oh there we go yeah and if i would have asked mm. him to put his tongue out for you you would mm. have seen that he has a very big tongue what we, how do we call that somebody with a big tongue Macroglossia? Yeah, yes, yeah. So, and what is the, and you actually described that, this is a typical appearance of a acromegaly. Mm. Now, who knows what the word acromegaly is coming from? What does that mean, acromegaly? Acro, mm. Greek for corners or edges, big edges, humongous edges. Look at his corner of his jaw, okay? What about uh, if he, he, he brings pictures to you? He didn't always look like that. Oh, so we should look at some prior photos. Ask him, do you have yeah. any photos of you from 5, 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, yeah. And that is something that, you know, if somebody still grows after their growth spurt and it Literally, the bone structure become bigger and the mm. tongue and the hands become bigger. His voice become deeper. Why is that? Why do you think his voice would become deeper? Mm. 
I wonder if that has to do with hormonal imbalances, maybe an increase in... Much simpler, much simpler. Much The larynx oh, grows. The, the, larynx. the structure itself? Yeah, yeah, the vocal cords and so on. The larynx, it become bigger and you get a small string, you have higher voice. You make a long string, you have deeper frequencies, deeper voice. In a way, he's the man. Um, why don't uh, why doesn't everybody to become have uh, acromegaly? You know, he's like right. Yeah, why? why you is know, that? he looks like he would, you know, probably do really well back in the Vikings, the Viking yes. ages. <laughs> but looks very masculine. Very looks very masculine. Mm -hmm. why, why is it a disease? Why why is it not good for you to have acromegaly? Well, I'm assuming because it's you're gonna have some sort of pathologies that are associated with it. You know, it's not sustainable. Many, many, many. Mm -hmm. What are those? What do you think what those are? Well, one, if we're talking about his macroglossia, that could cause obstructive sleep apnea. From there, that can cause pulmonary hypertension and you can have cardiopulmonary issues. Yeah. Um, what, about, what about if I show you this? This is a teeth of acromegaly patient. What's yeah. happening here? The jaw growing, but the teeth are not. Mm, so the teeth are starting to separate a little bit. Yeah, but that by itself is not a problem. But imagine the same thing happens to your heart. Correct? So cardiomegaly as well. Yes, what happens there? The heart is growing, but the valves are not. Oh, so would you? So would the valves start to separate as the? Yeah, like the teeth, like, like same the teeth, teeth, just like the teeth. Yeah. So now. The, that he might look very manly and that might not be a big problem but when it start your heart start to grow and the valve doesn't that can kill you mm. right yeah so, i like how you related it to the teeth here because that you know that that's a perfect way to explain it yeah mm -hmm. so it is a disease and uh, this disease is based on uh, you said it hormonal abnormality so what is that hormonal abnormality? Is anybody, any takers online who wants to, you know, just uh, talk about it, what those uh, hormonal abnormalities are? Yeah, That's me. Oh, okay, yeah, man. <laughs> take, a, take a shot at it. Um, just, just so you know, I am watching the comments so I can let you know who's commenting. Oh, okay, okay. So I do, I have a question about this um, issue that you're talking about. Can it ever manifest in teenagers before their adults? If it is okay. That is a very good question. As a matter of fact, uh, Neil, that might be one of your exams. In one of your exams, if somebody has, a, first of all, it is based on a hormonal imbalance. A hormone is produced more than it should. Okay. Mm -hmm. If it happens before the you know the teenager time in, in a kid. What does it cause then? And why is it different from acromegaly? So the different manifestations. We from never a... see that again. We, we never mm -hmm. see that because now we have so many medications, we can affect that. But it used to happen. Like right. hypo hyperthyroidism, does that have anything so, to do with it? Well, go ahead, Neil. Neil, go I, ahead. I think what he's trying to get at, the difference of it happening in a child and an adult is the, the fusion of the bone plates. So if you're having this much growth hormone occurring and the child, you know, his bone plates aren't fused, so he's going to grow up to be like seven foot or oh, eight feet tall or gigantism. But yeah, since okay. in an adult, his plates are already fused. So it's more like the growth is going to become more thick in that, in that nature. Are you able to see this picture? Of longitudinal. Are you able to mm. see this picture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is a picture of gigantism. Do you see he's walking with a with a cane? Yeah. yeah. He's he's a young man, but his joints are a, like an old man. Mm -hmm. For every inch you grow above five feet, you're cutting about three to five years of your life. Because your blood has to push up, your joint has to carry you. I know a woman are pushing the evolution in for men to get taller and taller, but as well, they are pushing the man to live less and less. Hmm. <laughs> are the joints of patients with gigantism stable? 
or why are they unstable? Why are the joints not able to, I guess, grow grow with it and be able to handle so, this size? When we grow, our mm -hmm. the surface grows in the exponent two, but our weight grows in exponent three cubed. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So more weight per square foot, mm. but, our, but our joints, our cartilage are just made to take so much and not more pressure. Mm -hmm. so, so the pressure is going to be a lot more focused on that smaller surface area. So it's yeah, just not but, able to withstand but, it. Uh, but uh, you asked, Amanda, actually a gigantic important question. Do we mm. have it in children? Yes, but it appears just differently. Like, look at this guy. He's proportional. He's big. Or look at this. He's, if you wouldn't see the other guy, you might think, okay, that is just a regular person. But mm -hmm. this guy is a regular person, and this one, it's not. Okay. So it's the same condition in an adult versus a teenager, but in a teenager, the body balances out faster to make people more balanced? No, it is not the same condition. It is the same hormonal abnormality, but as Neil said, in an adult, where the epiphyseal joint in the bones are growing together, bone cannot grow height in height anymore, but it grows to the side. Mm -hmm. Same thing with all our other organs. They all grow in the width, like the jaw grows in the width and the, the shoulder grow in the width, our larynx grows in the width, but it is a one dimensional growth because believe it or not, when our bone grows, all the other organ, they follow it. Mm. But that's here, the same hormone that would make you, as a matter of fact, we need that hormone. What happens if we don't have Hormone. What is that called, Neil? When that hormone is not enough of it there, when we are a child. When we are an adult, by the way, if mm -hmm. that hormone is not there, it has some effect, but not that devastating, okay? But if, if we, as a child, if we ha don't have enough of that, is that the French word? Like sort stature or dwarfism? Is that a dwarfism, proper term? But there's another name. Yes, is it? Is a is a kind of the dwarfism has many many different ways. Okay, mm. one of them, if it's proportional, it's a the lack of a human growth factor. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the dwarfism has uh, other kind of uh, reason as well that we can have dwarfism. Not all of that is there is a French word that is used for. Uh, to uh, identify specifically this condition, mm. you know what that is? Cre Have you heard that? Oh, isn't this from, this has to do with hypothyroidism, right? Or but con congenital, I believe. Uh, oh yeah, this is, this is you're, you're right. This is the, this is the thyroid. This is hypo, Amanda was re referring to. This is a, mm. this is the, uh, the one that is not, uh, human growth factor. This is the thyroid related. But um, guess what? What controls the thyroid or, or, uh, or thyroid uh, gland? What controls it? Your, well, you have your hypothalamus and then your pituitary. Yeah. And, then, and that would signal down to the thyroid. So let's look a little in the anatomy of the pituitary gland, okay? Mm -hmm. But before we do that, let's finish up this patient. So comes with unspecific symptoms and then they couldn't figure out anything and some smart guy in the ER noticed, look at his head, look at his face, look at his tongue. Mm -hmm. Something's going on, they get an MRI of the brain. And that is the MRI of the brain. What do you see? First of all, this is the MRI of the brain mm -hmm. in sagittal view and coronal view. And I'm going to go over some structure and just call them what they are. This is the tongue. This is the nose. This is the brain. Is that the pituitary gland? 
Is which that one? which one? Um, you can lower your mouse a little bit, a little to the left, 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 a little more. Is it that? Is it the pituitary, yeah. No way. That I've never seen one so huge. So it is also in the pituitary gland I've itself. Is also <laughs> I, I've seen and I operated on much bigger than that, but really, it, it is not a normal pituitary. You're mm. absolutely right. The normal pituitary is probably. It's even hard to see. Like the size of a little pea? Size of a little pea. That's correct. That is, and this is like 20 times, 30 times larger than what it should be. Mm. Now, let's talk about it. What else do we see? What is this structure called here, Neil? Pons. The pons. Mm -hmm. This structure called here. Your cerebellum. Cerebellum. And this is our cerebrum. Mm -hmm. This cavity here it has fluid in it what is it called the uh, this is the lateral ventricle no lateral ventricle would be lateral this is the third ventricle in the third middle. ventricle because lateral ventricle by definition here mm -hmm. in the coronal view you see the all in the coronal view and then here in the middle is the third ventricle mm -hmm. now this structure our, our spinal cord goes through down what is that called what, it comes out of the, the frame and magnum. Frame and magnum, correct. Mm -hmm. And then this obviously structure here is pituitary, which is not normal. Mm -hmm. Around that is a black, like a half moon crest kind of thing. What is that? The, well, I know the pituitary sits in the stella tersica. In cella, but, cella tersica. The and fish saddle. Mm. So I, I was also going to ask, how is that structure comparing to the pituitary gland? Did it also grow to give the pituitary gland space? Is yes. this some sort of... It just, now our brain grows and our skull with it. Anything that's mm. inside of our skull, the bone grows around it. Mm. So the cella has changed, correct. Now, a few important things. Mm -hmm. What is this cavity? Obviously, that's a cavity in front of the cella turstica and plivus here, pituitary. Mm -hmm. What is this cavity called? Here, you see that more here. Is what, this what we call ethmoid sinus, maybe? I'm going to throw a guess. Mm, it's a sinus. We call those cavities sinuses, like the sinus. here is the frontal sinus, mm -hmm. and here... Sphenoid sinus. Sphenoid? Okay. okay. Sphenoid. That's the one that looks like the butterfly. So mm. I'm like, I always use my hands when I'm thinking and then I can yeah. see. It. Yeah. Now, easy question. This is the tongue. Mm -hmm. what, is, what, what is this above the tongue? Is this the... Okay, this is the tongue. Yeah, the glottis. The, the, the glottis and that the palate. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So we are midline here, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, and this structure is here, clivus, the bone on the back of our mouth that separate the brain stem against our mouth. Mm. Okay, that is when some some crazy people say if you shoot shoot you shoot yourself in the mouth, that is what they say you should aim the gun at because that goes directly through brain stem, mm. back of your mouth and up, brain stem then. That where they say you should have, okay, we don't advocate that. We, let's not talk about that. But right. <laughs> that is but that is vital structure, obviously. Yeah, that's, that's the most primal um brain structure that we have. The brain yes. That is without that, no life. So so we agree there's a tumor there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do we do? Now, first of all, before we watch that, you see those dots black dots here here mm -hmm. here what is that these black dots well are these i'm gonna just give a guess are these where maybe vessels maybe blood arteries are going through yes very good carotid artery carotid mm. artery comes and make a make a turn there and that turn is what you see you see two loops of that turn mm. and and you see actually the loop itself too, right here. You oh, wow. Yeah. 
and it's called in a way, sometimes we call it carotid siphon because it's yeah. like a siphon. Why is that important? Well, if it's a siphon, if it's, I'm just going to assume because of the structure, if it's taking a turn, is that a, a spot where it could be more fragile for rupture or? No, it has or... a function actually. So see, nature is so unbelievably delicate mm -hmm. and wonderful. Around this carotid siphon, there is a there is a sponge of blood vessels. Do you know what that called? It's called corpus cavernosus. It's a blood vessel. It's a vein structure there. It cools the blood down on the way to the brain. So imagine, like you know, heat exchange. You know, the blood is warmer, comes in. It's some vessel, some veins around it, which is cooler because it has passed through our brain and so on. It has cooled down. And now that cools down the blood that comes in. So we don't overheat our brain. That's amazing. That you know, that's just like how the, an engine of a car works or any sort of vehicle with the coolant systems. Yes. Wow. You know, even in computers and the fans to make sure it's still operating optimally. And it makes some loops there. So it has mm. more contact to those venous cavernoses. Wow. Cavernoses. To increase the surface area of your cooling process. Yeah. yeah. Nature has its own patterns. Wow. So, but that I hope you understand that's a problem. The tumor is surrounded by both sides by major vessels. Oh, I see. How long does it take you if we cut that artery or if you poke a hole in it? How long does it take for you to die? Oof. Well, I'm going to assume really quickly because we are right next have to the... You, have you ever seen arterial bleeding? Arter well, it's pulsatile. You know, it's strong. It has pressure. It's not venous. And it's a major. It's a major diameter. Right. And even more worse, that bleeding going to be inside of your brain, calvarium, mm -hmm. has nowhere to go. So, so you understand? I hope everybody understands. This is a delicate place. I have I have a question since we're talking about this. Mm -hmm. So out of curiosity, does do these sort of patients have hydrocephalus or abnormal pressures within their no. cerebral spinal fluid? Or well, let's talk about that uh, pituitary tumors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pituitary tumor is by definition is pituitary. And pituitary steel is Practically, an uh, invagination of the dura is outside of the dura. Mm. So most of the pituitary problems, they do not push enough on the third ventricle aqueduct to cause hydrocephalus. Okay. But typically, they don't. But now, if you have hypothalamic tumor or craniopharyngioma, this is a different story. Yes, mm. they can push against the aqueduct. Now, we have... Uh, ventricle of the brain. Let's look at that since you're talking about that. Uh, brain ventricles. We have these major chambers, okay? Here. We have the lateral ventricle, mm -hmm. which has, you know, a certain cavity. And then through the aqueduct, it drains into the third, when, I'm sorry, through that opening, it opens to the third ventricle, and then we have the aqueduct that mm -hmm. drains from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, and then it, it goes around our brain and it flows all over the brain, mm. okay? So it comes out practically in the fourth ventricle, it comes out of the inner part of the brain and goes around the brain. So if there is a tumor here, can push on that aqueduct, then can, it can cause hydrocephalus. I see. But because it's a pituitary tumor, you're saying it's outside of the dura? The, the pituitary is it practically, it makes its own cavity. Mm. And usually, um, it, let's lo look it up, okay? Uh, anatomy of pituitary gland. So here it is. Mm. You see that there? This is oh, the brain. Yeah. And now it makes its own invagination of the dura. And if 
this grows here, there is a lot of structure here that prevent for that pressure to go back to the brain. Okay, practically outside of the brain. Yeah. Now, if you have problem uh, or tumor of the hypothalamus, that is more likely to push back toward the aqueduct and cause you, or craniopharyngioma is practically in the same area, but it's a little higher that that can cause hydrocephalus, okay? Mm. Now, here, and we are going to come back to that, but let's talk about this patient. So you understand we have major vessels here and we have to make sure those vessels are safe. We need to know where they are. That is what this is. This is an angiogram of the brain and post-angiogram or a CT angiogram, which visualize that if you don't have, you see the jaw here, you see that jaw mm -hmm. here? And then you see how uh, the arteries here, mm -hmm. the jaw, this is the mouth, this is the nose. Why did I get the arteries of the face on this patient? Why did I do that? That's a good question. Um, How do you think I went and took that tumor out? Transphenoidal, if we're going back to the sphenoid bone. Through the nose, the transphenoidal. So mm -hmm. I want to know that there is not a big artery there waiting for me to poke a hole in. Oh. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Then inside of this skull, you see here, I looked at those arteries as well. I want to know what to expect when I get there. Right. So let's talk about that. If this patient has passed the hormonal treatment, it didn't work and so on, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. We always try non-surgical thing first, but then we decided to do the surgery on this patient. What we do, and here is, you see the, um, practically the uh, label of what you see here. So the translabial, Pituitary transphenoidal approach. Transphenoidal, because we have to go through transphenoidal cavity. I'm, I'm just going to unshare my screen and show it on my own uh, lips, okay? What we do, we put the patient back. As a matter of fact, I have some uh, videos that shows how this patient is positioned. Patient laying back with the head tilted back in pin, and then we prep the nose with the uh, uh, antiseptic. And then actually, this is one of very few places cocaine has a medicinal use. We mm. put cocaine soaked uh, sponges in the nose. What happens then? The vessel- Vasoconstriction. Yes, vasoconstriction. So the patient doesn't bleed much during the surgery. And then uh, we, I take the lip up. Under the lip, just about this half a centimeter to a centimeter in the, in the fold, look, that fold, about half a centimeter above it, I, I make a horizontal incision, about an inch, not more than that. And then I prepare that plane, go to the nasal septum. I go forward until the cartilage septum meets the uh, bony septum, and then I literally remove about a centimeter or one and a half centimeter of, uh, of nasal septum, which is very thin. I remove it. I develop that plane, and you see literally those, those two layers uh, go against each other, and then I put a, a tube in. That tube goes until I am on the sphenoidal sinus. Mm. And that is the view. You don't see much, but already the bone in the middle has been removed. And what you see here is the wall of the sphenoid sinus that I have poked through. Unfortunately, never on the pictures are never do justice to actual, um, actual you know, view of the microscope. Is there a way you could record the procedure while you're doing it? Yes. I don't believe I recorded this one, but yeah, most of new microscope, they let you uh, record that. Now, have you heard of the device called pituitary rongeur? No, I haven't. 
That's a device that is used in many, many surgeries. Have you ever seen this device? Oh, I think you're gonna have to share your screen again. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, you don't see any of that. I'm just talking and- Oh yeah, not right now. <laughs> okay, so you didn't really see what I was showing you. So here, oh. let's go back. So the angiogram and so on, and then mm -hmm. this where you uh, literally take the septum off, go to the, uh, the sphenoid sinus, and this is the first intraoperative. This is my tube. And on the bottom of the tube, you see the front wall of the sphenoid sinus and which I have poked a hole in. And then underneath, you see the shiny membrane is the dura over the tumor. And wow. then here, I use different tools, instruments. One of them is the so-called pituitary rongeur. And this is all done by a one inch incision, one inch opening? Yeah, even less than that. Wow. So this is the rongeur. Do you mm. see why it's called pituitary rongeur? Because it comes up, so the handle is not in your way. Oh, I see. And there are many instruments that, that are, are similar to this. Similar, they come up, they are bayoneted. Mm. So your hand is not in your way. And then there is a group of ring correct, and that is actually what you see right here. You see that here? Yeah. This is the ring correct. They come in different sizes, goes different direction, where once I am there, I see the tumor, I take a small little knife, I slit it open, then the tumor itself is actually very soft. Mm. Then what I do, I use this different kind of correct. Let me go back here. My direction of the surgery is this way. Hmm. I go here, take the wall, the bony wall off here. There's another thin, paper thin bone here. I take it off. And then you see the shiny thing is the dura over the tumor. I slit it open. Sometimes when you open it up, the tumor empties itself already. Hmm. And that is a problem with that because this tumor not only they grow and produce a bad tumor, they put other good part of the pituitary under pressure and as well in, uh, make their work harder. So, and then I go with that uh, the ring correct and I empty that tumor out. And here is the intraoperative view of it where you see the ring correct going on there. Now you see that there, the ring is going now beneath the uh, bone. And mm -hmm. I'm now going in all direction and emptying the tumor out. And so this, is the so when you're removing this tumor, mm -hmm. is it the, are you removing the entire pituitary gland or are you able to demarcate the difference of the tumor and the gland? Well, I, this is the mastery of the resection itself. The mm. tumor is softer than the rest of the pituitary. Okay. You have to cause enough pressure to get the tumor out without causing too much pressure to damage the rest of the pituitary. As a matter of fact, if you cause too much, if you cause too much pressure, you make a poke a hole in the artery, in the carotid artery. Mm. And then that is not a nice thing to have. That's a very dangerous situation. But that is the mastery that you cause enough pressure to just get the tumor out, but not normal tissue. It's mm. something like imagine you have a um two different kinds of pudding, because that's what they are. One right. is softer than the other, and you scratch all the soft pudding without causing any damage to the hard pudding. Yeah, that makes sense. Gelatin, gelatin. Oh, maybe it's the better thing. You know, imagine you have pudding and gelatin. Mm -hmm. You scratch all, all the pudding, pudding and gelatin, out. yeah. You scratch all the pudding out without damaging the gelatin. That is how fine your motions and your dealing with that has to be, okay? So, and here's post-operative MRI. The tumor, what you see inside, you see that it's still big, mm -hmm. but what you see there is some material that I put in to you know, make sure that it doesn't bleed. It doesn't enhance anymore. It's the, it's the, um, 
all what you see here is the postoperative fluid there, but no tumor anymore. So, and here again, another postoperative picture, and you see the sphenoid sinus is filled with fluid, which is not unusual. When you do surgery, it will fill up. Uh, but you see now, still, the pituitary is still. You see it so much nicer now. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's talk about the pituitary a little more. And we are going to not spend more than five minutes now. Pituitary is one of the most complex glands. As a matter of fact, is the, is the gland that controls other gland. Um, it is made of two parts. Mm -hmm. the, what, what do you know about those two parts of the pituitary? You have the adenohypothesis and the neurohypothesis. So the know? neural one is the posterior pituitary, and this is a direct neural connection to the brain, whereas the adeno is um, hormonal and through the vasculature, it's being connected to the hypothalamus. Yes. The posterior will release ADH and I believe oxytocin. Mm -hmm. And then the anterior will release the rest of the hormones, such as the ACTH, the cortisol, and you know, the, the, many the hormone that controls many other glands. Right. Okay. So um, practically the posterior part, which is smaller, is the ending of the neuron that start actually in the hypothalamus. Mm. It's really nothing really to get built there. Mm. The actual hormone is built in three or four what we call nucleus mm -hmm. up there. And then the axon come down and then the hormone get secreted like a transmitter. But in the anterior part is bigger because actually the cell that produce those hormones are right there. Mm. Both of them are under control of the hypothalamus. And the problem is that if something start growing here, not only that function is involved in that, but as well, the other cells can are under pressure or damage, but as well, the pressure on the axons of the posterior uh, uh, part of the pituitary in, as well reduces or uh, limits the function of the uh, so-called so -called the neurohypophysial uh, function. So um, thanks God for many of these problems we have now medication that can help with the treatment mm -hmm. and surgery is uh, truly uh, preserved for those cases that uh, the hormonal or um, or other medication cannot uh, fix the problem but the, the transphenoidal approach has been truly a marvelous and it's not new transphenoidal approach are not new mm. so uh, it's a very slick operation and uh, that practically we avoid the entire brain mm. uh, because we, we know that the damage to the brain can be very significant if you come from any other angle to that location because you have to pass through the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus is a prime structure in the brain. Just if the tumor extend up, there are some other what we call transcalosal approach where you split the brain hemisphere, you take a, here, let me go back here. The gyrus here is called the single gyrus up mm -hmm. there and corpus callosum. And if you split the hemisphere of the brain, you bypass the single gyrus on the bottom, this corpus callosum, where the nerves from, or the axon from one part of the brain go to the other, you can split them and make a small hole and then come down here and then through the, floor of the third ventricle, you can as well get to that region. But that is much bigger surgery. Mm. Preserve By splitting the fibers of the corpus callosum, are you damaging them or are you more separating them to make yourself a space? Damage them. Damage. Okay. But there is enough there that uh, it, that can be done pretty safely. As a matter of fact, for mm. children, certain children who have uh, unintractable seizure, we caught entire corpus callosum, we call callosotomy, mm -hmm. to prevent that seizure activity goes from one hemisphere to another. That's still being done, that procedure. But again, so people tolerate that well, but still much bigger surgery. 
and coming uh, transphenoidal. So it is 440. Uh, we covered a lot of areas. If there are any question, uh, we, uh, we can answer it. Otherwise, we should stay at this point, okay? We talked about the anatomy, it's about physiology, about the appearance, clinical appearance, the manifestation based on the age of the patient mm -hmm. and the, the, the diagnosis. And what is else important, including vascular structure. Mm -hmm. And as well, we talked about the surgery and anatomical consideration in the surgery. Any question? I have two questions. Go ahead. So um, first one, how long does the surgery typically take you, the transphenoidal approach? I, I did that surgery in 45 minutes. Okay. Do you, I, I've heard with this approach that you guys sometimes partner up with ENTs or head and neck surgeons? I, if you're trained to do that yourself, like I'm trained in MD Anderson, where hmm. I did my own, I'm, I'm not sure if you know MD Anderson is yeah. the major cancer center in the United States and the world. So I'm trained with surgeon who did it themselves. They taught me how to do that. So I did it by myself. And that is why it took 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Usually if you partner via ENT, it's going to take them two hours to open up for you. And then you add another three, two hours to, for you to do the surgery. Mm -hmm. Whereas because I, as a neurosurgeon, know exactly what I need, I make the smallest amount of opening for me to get the job done. Whereas ENT doctor doesn't know how much access you need. He's going to come and take five times more bone away than what you really need. Mm. So that is why I did it all by myself. Amazing. And then question number two. So with pituitary tumors, um, I don't know if you know or if the literature knows, is this hereditary or is it sporadic or do we know anything about that? Well, um, there are certain few tumors that in the brain are elsewhere they are hereditary, but they are much more rare. In vast mm. majority of the pituitary tumors are just sporadic. sporadic. And mostly they are benign. That's a good news. But in that location, uh, benign is a very soft word or very right. limited word. Because it's functional. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. I learned a lot. Well, uh, I, if somebody else has a question, you can just uh, comment and uh, uh, be, make sure that eventually somebody answers them. But it was great. Uh, you guys have a great weekend. It was always nice to have you on our Essence of Medicine podcast clinical case review. Thank you, Neil, for joining us. And thank you, Amanda, for setting this up. Thank you for having me. Take thank care. Bye-bye.